This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 591, recorded on March 13th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today... From Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello there, Vincent. It's Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th. Interesting. The stores are crowded. I must say, before anything else, the stores are so crowded. Costco has a line that goes all the way around it. What are they looking for? Toilet paper and milk. <laughs> In that order. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And I have a public service message. Stop <laughs> buying so damn much toilet paper, people. <laughs> Why? Why? I, I, I went to the store today just to do my routine shopping, and yeah, the toilet right. paper shelf is exactly. empty. Exactly. I, I don't understand. No, I, I think they're going to plan on celebrating when this is all over by throwing right, toilet Right, by paper. toilet papering everything. Yes, yeah, that that's must right. be that's it. It's for the ticker tape parade. <laughs> exactly. They're not going to stop making it. Yeah. From Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, everybody. It's great to be Hello. here. Um, uh, it's been gone for a little while, but it's really nice. Um, I'm spending some time now learning how to teach online. Um, so my wow, TWIV exactly. experience is coming in very handy. Yeah, we're oh, all teaching great. online, yep. And from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. 77 hey, degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy here in Austin, Texas. And, uh, you know, being a person of elevated spiritual status, I don't need toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> we have a returning guest. This is his fifth appearance on TWIV. He was last year in January from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Ralph Barrick, welcome back. Pleasure to be here, Vincent. And I have 15 cases of toilet paper, and I am willing to wow. sell it to anyone here on this uh, call for the uh, slightly uh, inflated price of uh, $10 a roll. Wow. <laughs> wow, it's impressive. Do people not know that they have showers if they really got desperate, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Water does the trick, yeah. And, and paper production is not something that is going to get disrupted that's just anyway what about the milk why are they buying up milk because they like milk because that's correct. that's a that's a blizzard thing everybody goes and buys bread and milk before the blizzard no, you're i right. don't know why and, and eggs you're right. and eggs right and they wake up the next morning they say uh i guess we'll have french toast exactly <laughs> right yeah uh, by the way i have a little bit of breaking news three minutes ago I just, this email just came in from the superintendent of my daughter's school closing uh the schools for our whole district until march 27th Roger that. Yep. So even here in Western Mass, where we don't have any confirmed cases yet, they're shutting it down. Yeah. I think this is an excellent decision. Yeah, I agree. Yes. We're trying to convince too. the gov the mayor of New York City to shut down public schools. It's a little more complicated here because a lot of these kids don't have anywhere to go during the day. Right. But, right. Um, I think that that's it's right. important because everything else well, is pretty every, much every shut down. Everybody is going to have that to deal with. But that's, yeah. Yeah. Well, Ralph, when you joined us back in February on the 24th, there were fewer than a thousand cases globally, most of them in China. SARS CoV 2 talking about, in case anybody didn't realize. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> That's all I talk about these days. Yeah, exactly. Now it's we're well over, uh, well over 100,000. And I would just want to say New York City so far has 328 cases with no deaths, and we have, uh, a good hospital system with capacity and uh, the governor has been proactive in getting a uh, testing online. It's important for the States to be independent. Yep. Yep. Anyway, Ralph, let's chat with you. Last time, uh, one of your key points was that looked like SARS CoV-2 is community spread, which you said is different from SARS one. And has that been borne out in our experience? Well, I think we're, we're, approaching 150,000 cases globally. Uh, in the United States, we have 2,000 cases. We are maybe a few cases short of 2,000 cases. So there's no question there's community spread. There's no question that there's asymptomatic spread, and there's no question that we are now in a full-blown pandemic. And that's right. 2,000 known cases. That's correct. 
there are there's no question uh, that there are uh, undetected networks uh, and transmission chains that exist across the country that are in- infecting additional people. Okay, so that's really. Uh, by the way, Ralph, thanks for being here. This is terrific. Uh, that's really critical to me because I had questions about this. Um, so asymptomatic spread, you mean that there are people walking around who themselves are not experiencing any symptoms, but are nevertheless infected and can infect other people, correct? That's what I believe, yes. Okay. Correct. And then there are people, of course, with mild symptoms who may have, they think they have the flu or something else and they don't bother to get checked at all and they are spreading virus as well, right? That's correct. So the, that's, the asymptomatic, that's, asymptomatic spread is really, is really critical because that means that you can't, uh, for example, if you're questioning whether or not to uh, convene your regular small meeting or something, you can't say, we're safe as long as you stay home if you're feeling sick. That's right. correct. Okay. And looking, looking globally, um, one of the things that stood out to me, there's a, a kind of a general notion in any kind of emergency is that no news is often bad news. And there are a whole bunch of countries in the world, mostly poorer countries, that we've heard nothing from. Right. Um, I, I think that all I've seen is one report from Nigeria representing all of sub-Saharan Africa. I haven't seen any other, um, sub-Saharan there are African other cases. In Sub-Saharan there Africa. are there that have actually been, okay. Um, the, um, just, but there's a, there's a paucity of news and of reports from Correct. the Correct. whole region and from Southeast Asia and from, um, just large swaths of the globe. And, and I'm wondering, um, should we should we expect those sometime soon? Is somebody trying to get there and test people? About a month ago, um, uh, it was fairly clear that there are only two places in Africa that, for example, that could actually do testing for the new virus. That's changed yeah. now, but in reality, um, huge uh, tracks and uh, nation tracks uh, are doing little if any testing. And so this is this is a problem um, also in other countries around the world. Right. Um, and uh, and I don't know what we, what we can really do about it. Uh, in the United States, we have our own problems with uh, testing. Yes. yes. Speaking of countries, uh, third world countries with bad <laughs> testing systems, here we are. <laughs> Ralph, if you have a case, confirmed case, what's your estimation of how many other cases there would be associated with that. I've heard all kinds of numbers, 10, 100, 1,000. Give us... The RO, or the number of people that become infected uh, from an infected individual, um, are is, is estimated somewhere between 2.5 and 3.2. Um, mm. That's actually quite high. That means that for every case... There is uh, two and a half to three additional cases. Um, uh, contemporary um, uh, flu is much closer to two or 1.8, 1.6. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is very explosive spread and, and rapid transmission. It's even more expl- explosive because you have uh, rare individuals or maybe not so rare individuals who are super spreaders who can infect uh, 15, 20 people uh, just passing through a room. And I'd like to throw in a shout out to any Biogen employees who are listening. Um, uh, <laughs> Ma- Massachusetts now is number one in New England for confirmed uh, SARS-CoV-2 cases. Uh, and s- uh, the vast majority of those so far are due to a single meeting at Biogen headquarters near Boston, which resulted in, I think, 77 people getting infected. When was that meeting? That was just last week mm-hmm. or no, that was, uh, sorry, that was, that was a couple of weeks ago. That was, February, uh, I think. Yeah. yeah, that was back in February. Mm-hmm. And so Ralph, thanks for being here. So there is now confirmed evidence of super spreaders. There were, there was confirmed evidence of super spreaders by the Chinese back on the 22nd of January, uh, where mm-hmm. they, uh, documented a single person infecting 13 healthcare workers. So I don't think there's ever been any doubt that that's been, well confirmed. And that's that's fairly typical of infectious diseases, though, isn't it? I, I am less 
Drunk super from, spreaders, from what I understand, are much more rare with influenza, and um, okay. this this is probably this is clearly common with the emerging <laughs> coronaviruses. What's not known is whether the contemporary coronaviruses have a similar phenotype or not, and it would actually be a very interesting model to look at. Is this a property of this fa this family of viruses? Right. Yeah. One of the things I've seen bandied about also is this this doubling time of cases, right? I don't know where that comes from. Do you have some sense of that, Ralph? Well, that sounds like epidemiology to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he says with yep. a sigh. Aren't you, in this, aren't you in the school of epidemiology there? I am, I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, That's why I'm feeling... Uh, uh, Intimidated by the question. No, that's cool. we don't know. Just, big, it's our, uh, we don't know the answers. So the the doubling time can be affected by a, a large number of things. One of which is um, the incubation time. Mm -hmm. right. So in this case, we have individuals who can who um, may be exposed, but don't begin to show symptoms until uh, fourteen days. Although most people are in the range of five to seven days, and they begin to show symptoms. Um, the doubling time is also dependent on population density, um, probably virus titer, where the virus is replicating in the uh, upper respiratory tract, and exactly where in the upper respiratory tract it may be res replicating. That would help um, uh, fuel uh, rapid transmission to uh, contacts. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, in comparison, for example, the incubation time and the transmission time for flu is much, much shorter. Um, so I don't have a good answer. I guess the, the short answer is I don't have a good answer for your question. That's okay. Right. okay. So we have 15 million flu infections this year in the U.S. Is that, is that, a, is that a number that we're going to get at with SARS-CoV-2, you think? Uh, the first... Uh, the, Part of that depends on how well we test um, and wh whether we begin to do serologic testing. Uh, so, for example, I've heard recently that the Chinese aren't planning on doing serology on their population, um, which hmm. tells me that there's probably significantly more infections than the 80 plus yes. thousand that reported, yeah. and they don't want the actual number True. to be reported. I imagine right. in the U.S. and Europe, those, those numbers will eventually be reported. Uh, certainly, serological assays are uh, are, um, are are available now to begin to look at those uh, those types of questions. Um, the big question is, what is the denominator? How many um, right. is the denominator uh, two or five times or ten times higher than what we right. are seeing in terms of clinical disease? Right, and I actually uh, seems fairly likely that that denominator is significantly higher which is good news because then the mortality rates drop accordingly. Um, for example, as an as a over 60 male, I'm, uh, I would hope that that denominator is 10 or 50 times higher than <laughs> yes. well, so other reporting because then my, my risk level would go down to about 0.1%, uh, and I, I feel much better about that than at 3%. Trouble is that uh, if you age adjust the uh, cases and the acquisitions and the severities, uh, it puts us in a danger zone again. I'd love to know how many people have died, what their average age was, and I don't know if we know that figure or not. Well, from an early study in China, we do. Right? Yes, we do. Yeah. Right. Does it remain the same? So if you're over... Uh, 80, the mortality rate is just under 15%. If you're 70 to 79, the mortality rate's 8%. If you're 60 to 69, it's 3.4%. Right. If you're over 50, I can't remember what it is. And if you're under 50, it's around 0.4. And if you're under 30 or 25, it's uh, less than 0.1. Right. What was it in Washington, though? Because that was a, a place where there were lots of elderly and uh, – Im immune compromised, I presume, and their death rate was fairly high, as I recall. Uh, and I believe there's still a significant number of people who are in intensive care. So the actual mortality rate in, exactly that, right. in that cluster is not not clear. But again, that's a unique population exactly. of elderly exactly. that are co-housed in close proximity. That's right. Yeah, that's um, right. Uh, uh, probably the most vulnerable 
conditions to live under uh, in, yeah. in the current outbreak of the, I guess I call it the, I'll call it the millennial virus since everybody else is coming up with new names. <laughs> <laughs> I can also pick on the millennials uh, that way. Right. Yeah, Being a baby boomer, you know, we got to get our revenge. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Well, and since given given the age distribution and the fact that people in the millennial age group are mostly surviving it, would be would it be appropriate to say that millennials are killing this virus? <laughs> Oof. Well, I have to I have to process that for a little bit before I answer yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> given the large number of people who may be infected, um, can we expect some of those people to have immunity um, to be maybe be protected um, against this virus in the future? Uh, almost certainly. Um, and I saw some very interesting data from Stan Perlman the other day, who has been looking at um, serum neutralization titers of MERS patients uh, from, the kingdom, from the Middle East Kingdom, Saudi of Arabia area. And it's quite interesting that um, uh, people peak um, fairly quickly with high neutralization titers, but then they wane over the next year to uh, almost uh, background levels or just slightly above background levels uh, by the second year. Hmm. And with, with MERS, uh, there have been several reports of people who seroconverted. They were RT-PCR positive, and then their serum neutralizing titers and even ELISA titers went to almost zero within a few months. Hmm. So the... the and, and it has not been well studied, uh, but it should be studied. And this is the contemporary human coronaviruses. Nobody knows how they maintain themselves in human populations. They don't undergo rapid antigenic variation like um, influenza. There's not 115 uh, common cold or coronavirus type uh, uh, genotypes or whatever they're called, serotypes. Sorry, Vincent, I just butchered the coronaviruses. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so one hypothesis is, is that they cause a transient um, immune, immune, immune response, protective immune response that wanes quickly, and then they can reinfect and cause mild upper respiratory tract infections, and that's how they maintain themselves. Mm -hmm. So it is quite possible. And there's been, re there's been a number now of uh, reported cases in China of SARS-2 infections um, where people were documented to be infected uh, and uh, recovered. They were RT-PCR negative. They went home, and then they became reinfected uh, a month later or so. So um, it's an interesting question that you asked. Uh, uh, fortunately, the U, fortunately, that's not the right word. Please delete <laughs> the word fortunately. Uh, in this case, the United States has sufficient cases that we can actually track the, serolo the serologic responses of the individuals and their general immune, uh, both B and T cell responses after infection. And we can get a handle on uh, the, um, the long-term immunity um, that may be elicited after infection. And that's a factor, I assume, in, in – well, so what's going on in China now, at least from reports I've seen, is that they seem to have seen a tapering off in cases. And, of course, the Chinese government is promoting this as these draconian measures that they implemented must have worked. Um, another interpretation might be that everybody who was susceptible got infected and either immune or dead, and now the virus has burned out. Um, but – Presumably, that's one of the reasons they're not going to do serology testing there. But that could—that is something that hopefully other countries will be monitoring as this develops, right? I think those are certainly excellent points. Another uh, potential uh, point is that uh, the Chinese are primarily reporting cases in their quarantine zones, um, which right. involve 100 million people, and that the uh, Chinese in rural communities – um, are not uh, uh, being picked up by their surveillance systems. Right. So this, uh, there must be memory, though. And as, as you say, maybe the second infections are milder. But what... Absolutely. What... In, that case, in, in the case of the contemporary human coronaviruses, yeah. they, they would thought most the data supports the idea that they're, more, they're much more mild. So that would still encourage us to make vaccines because... Even then, you would have a milder second yeah, infection, right? right? 
Right. The advantage of a vaccine might may well be that you include a an adjuvant as a boost of uh, immunity that uh, circumvents whatever um, anti uh, viral uh, gene sets uh, are present that are uh, uh, attenuating the uh, long term protective immune response. So, Brianne, do you think this is a problem with memory, or is it something else? Um, it could be a problem with memory. Um, I think that I would have to look a little bit more closely at things like the specific cytokines, um, and some of the T cell data, uh, that, uh, we can see from some of the patients. Um, but given the short term, uh, persistence of the virus and the lack, or sorry, the short term persistence of the immunity and the lack of antigenic drift um, that Ralph mentioned, I could certainly imagine this being a problem with memory. And of course, you're making me want to run into the lab and start playing around <laughs> and looking at some of this right now. <laughs> I, I would say the, the global expert on that would be Stan Perlman. He would be a wonderful person to have on the show. Good idea. All right, we'll get um, idea. And uh, another possibility, though, is that the virus just confines itself to the very upper respiratory tract and knows. And so, um, where it's only having to deal with the uh, uh, pre-existing mucosal uh, immune response that uh, is present, which may be, you know, may, which may allow for um, a much more transient infection before memory gets boosted. Mm. Potentially. Now I'm gonna. Okay, so when we're done, I'm gonna call my sister who's working on mucosal immunity and ask her about it. <laughs> that, that was, that's good. I'm not an immunologist, so. It probably insulted half of the country. <laughs> so, Ralph, how does how does this stop? Do we have to uh, uh, have a certain percentage of the population uh, with, uh, uh, experience this infection and uh, become immune, so that we develop on a population scale an appropriate herd immunity, uh, or? Uh, perhaps seasonality, a little of both. When does this, what are the circumstances under which this dies down? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, uh, the only way to answer this course is, spec is by speculation. So okay. clearly one approach is that if you do not put in any intervention strategies in and you allow the virus to run its course, eventually you'll hit um, herd immunity levels where 70% of the population has been infected. And there's sufficient herd immunity um, that protects people from reinfection that drives the RO of the, uh, the SARS-2 virus below one, and it, it burns itself out and goes to extinction. That's a brutal way to handle a new emerging infection. <laughs> uh, basically, everybody has to get infected. So, so, so a better approach <laughs> is to implement public health intervention strategies where you um, – dampen the uh, transmission rate of the virus and uh, reduce the number of infections um, such that um, <clears throat> uh, the number of potential contacts that are available for infection are significantly reduced, and that can also help to burn out the outbreak. Uh, ultimately, I think... Um, Long-term protection of the human population is going to require uh, herd immunity uh, to reach about seventy percent in our population, wow. and that either and it's going to that's either going to have to be through natural infection or vaccination. Right. Sure, and at right va vaccination would presumably be the more humane way to accomplish that. Uh, that would yeah. be my preferred choice. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but Ralph, do we have a good understanding of why the original SARS outbreak burned itself out? Sure. Um, there were three drivers for the original SARS outbreak. The first was that we had a known animal reservoir, which were civets and raccoon dogs that were transmitting virus to people oh. in open markets. So right. if you uh, call all of those animals and close the open markets, that was the uh, you effectively block that transmission chain. The second transmission chain was that um, hospitals were acting as um, – uh, in essence, uh, amplification centers where uh, patients would inoculate sure. other patients and healthcare workers who would inoculate other patients. Mm -hmm. And uh, to stop that, barrier nursing had to be employed 
rapidly and dramatically, and that reduced uh, the, uh, the opportunity for hospital settings to be major amplifiers of disease. And then the third was that SARS coronavirus transmitted 24 to 36 hours after you develop clinical disease. Consequently, quarantine and contact tracing allowed sure. you to isolate those people in sufficient time so that they couldn't transmit. And the combination of all three, uh, uh, blocking all three pathways or transmis- transmission chains uh, led to the, uh, the RO or the reproductive rate of the virus to fall below one and it went extinct. Wow. Oh, we, we, we don't have any, we yeah. don't know what the animal reservoir is for SARS-2. I was just going to ask you that. So it's, it's, um, and importantly, what people aren't thinking about is that as you have a new emerging virus that uh, has a novel receptor binding interface as compared to SARS, circles the globe, opportunities for new animal reservoirs mm. are now available mm-hmm. right. in the United States, in Canada, yep. in South America, in Africa, in Europe. And uh, so we could suddenly <laughs> see um, uh, some common animal um, in the United States being a reservoir for this virus for the future. And so that's something that we need to look at. Uh, as far as I know, no one is looking at that in the United States or elsewhere. Wow, so it went, from animals, that. went from animals to humans in China, then circled the globe in humans. And now the main reservoir presumably is humans. But as you point out, that's an that's a really interesting possibility that we can then infect animals in our environment that then become future reservoirs, including bats, including bats, including bats, including bats. Right. Including bats. And so the virus could cycle back in um, and then begin to undergo recombination and um, um, mutation driven selection to pull out new variants that could come out again in the future. Mm. So what species in nature uh, do we know about that harbor coronaviruses now? Is it all over That's, the place? If it's oh. a mammal or a bird, it's probably got a coronavirus in it. Right. Okay. But SARS-like coronaviruses. Are- SARS-like coronaviruses are in bats yeah. um, and also pandolins, yeah. it turns out. Okay. That's right. So as far as you know, are, are, are the Chinese or people in China, I was told not to say the Chinese scientists, <laughs> people in China – working to still find out what the uh, animal that transmitted the infection was? Because we know it was originally in bats because of the sequence homology, but what was the actual immediate transfer, right? Uh, right. As far as I know, they have they have not identified the actual reservoir species. Uh, the closest, uh, there, were, there were reports about pandolins as potentially being the intermediate host, but pandolin viruses are 88 to 90 percent identical to SARS-2. In comparison, uh, civet and raccoon dog strains of SARS coronavirus were 99.8 percent identical mm. to SARS coronavirus from 2003. In other words, you're talking about a handful of mutations between civet strains, raccoon dog strains, and human strains in 2003. Uh, pandolins have uh, over 3,000 nucleotide changes. No way they are the reservoir species. Mm. Absolutely no right. chance. Okay. Mm. So it's unknown. I know they're looking, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I don't believe they have found it yet. Or if they found it, the paper has not been published yet. But it does raise the, it does raise the important question that um, other reservoir hosts could become uh, very important for maintaining the virus in human populations um, throughout the globe. Uh, I know we talked about this last time, but I'd like to revisit uh, as a check seasonality. Uh, is there, uh, what's your expectation or understanding about potential seasonality for this virus? That is, uh, as the uh, weather changes, will it have an effect on the infection? It should reduce the RO rate. It won't drive it to extinction, I don't believe. Mm-hmm. So the the um, typical peak season for coronaviruses are um, early winter to early spring. Um, SARS, for example, peak cases were in April, and uh, even uh, very high numbers of cases in May through the end of May. The virus went extinct. Uh, SARS coronavirus went extinct by the end of July. Uh, summertime will reduce the rate of transmission uh, 
And so these explosive amplification probably won't occur, but the virus will continue to spread in human populations. It and does uh, reduce the rate. Uh, so sunlight, warmer temperatures, humidity all reduce the, um, the viability of virus on surfaces and contact spread is probably an incredibly important uh, means of spreading the virus in the, uh, from person to person. So what's happening right now in the Philippines? Uh, there are there are. <laughs> <laughs> You're on trial, Ralph. I thought this was a friendly show. Okay. <laughs> no, it is. It is. I'm just. I'm wondering. I'm, I'm trying to make sense of this. Okay. A great, great sunlight's going to get rid of it, but what happens? <laughs> or or Iran. Yeah. Or or Iran or or Australia, where it's currently summer. Uh, all those are true. All those are. Those are very, very good points. There was a case in Brazil, too. So, um, right. like I said, if I, I tried to be very clear that it would not stop the spread of the virus. It may it right. reduce the rate of spread of the virus. Now, if you have very dense populations in close proximity, that's going to be mitigated by the, um, the sort of the human population demographics of each area. I think also the immunity levels make a big difference. There's zero immunity, right? There's zero immunity across the globe. So that's going to also make a big difference. So the idea that the virus will go extinct in the summertime is not going to happen. Uh, I, I, am, uh, I am holding out hope. Maybe that's the better way to say it. I am holding out hope that the rate of transmission goes down in the summer, which would make it more vulnerable to public health intervention strategies. Well, and, I, and I guess we'll see a combination of things since the virus emerged in the late winter um by summer we should see herd immunity in most populations worldwide starting to emerge and at the same time we'll have the increasing temperatures and humidity and maybe a combination of things is going to going to help drive it down and school gets out yes school and also school. get well no school well, now that now that school's out. World canceled <laughs> school's out forever <laughs> they're going to still be going on into august at this rate <laughs> right, and I think those are all important features that would w that would help. Sure, we should point out that fl influenza is seasonal in temperate climates like ours, but it's also seasonal in the tropics, and we have no idea what drives that seasonality. Right, because right. in temperate climates, it's as Ralph said, low humidity, low temperature, but in the tropics, it's hot and mu humid. So, what's going on there, Ralph? What's the fraction of Roughly, uh, droplet transmission versus uh, contact for SARS-CoV-2, do we know? Unknown. Okay. But both make a contribution, right? I believe so. I think the, uh, the cruise liners have clearly demonstrated that's the case. There were examples of workers who were putting trays down in front of people's rooms who weren't coming out because they were mm. uh, sort of like germaphobes, but they were still getting infected. Mm. What about fecal-oral transmission? It's a real possibility. Mm. That happened with SARS-1, right? It did. The Amory Gardens outbreak was a community condominium that aerosolized feces when you flushed the toilets, and, and that went into the uh, ventilation system and f infected people on multiple floors of that building. Uh, in fact, mm. the plumes of aerosolized f virus feces mixtures uh, drifted out of the building, out of the top of the building, onto other condominiums and infected people in them as well. So it is certainly possible. Um, Plumbers can save lives. <laughs> That's right. And now we come back to toilet paper. Yes, now we come back to toilet paper. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, you wonder about things like uh, uh, the restroom facilities in airlines and, you know, on airplanes. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty big vacuum there. Does that generate an aerosol or not? Well, it's interestingly, it's not a, it's not exactly a vacuum. It's um, the the air pressure is being directed sort of downward and into a holding tank. Um, contrary to what some people believe, that's not actually flushing to the outside. Um, <laughs> so, so I would expect most. So I don't have to look up when I walk around anymore. Is that what no, you're telling me? No, oh. right. So, so most most air. No, in fact, um, it's a it can cause a major disaster if any of that uh, holding tank content <laughs> leaks out and puts ice on the outside of the plane. Um, but I would expect, actually, airplane lavatories to do a pretty good job of aerosolizing material, and hopefully the treatment chemicals are as effective against 
SARS-CoV-2 as they are against uh, other better known pathogens. I think an airplane is not where you want to be right now. Most no, likely. you definitely don't want True. to be in an airplane Correct. right now. And some, we, we mentioned last time that, you know, the air is re- mostly recirculated. We have an email about that where basically you know, they don't take in a lot of air from the outside because it's expensive to heat it up. So yep. getting a lot of recirculation. So uh, I, on this topic, we had an arc years ago about the difference between airborne and aerosolized, aerosolized. I don't know what words to apply here, but this is, uh, there's different degrees of this, right? When you talk about droplet transmission, you're talking about virus on, uh, air, uh, at least briefly airborne droplets, but that don't stay suspended in the air and drop. Uh, but uh, rather drop to the ground or whatever, ultimately. Correct. Um, as opposed to the word I'm going to use, correct me if I'm wrong, is airborne, where you have particles that are so small that they can be maintained airborne for uh, a long period of time and long distances. Am I talking sense here? That's correct, as far as I understand it. Yes, that's and, correct. And so where... Uh, does coronavirus, and I, I assume that this is a, a continuum, right? Different droplet sizes, different times uh, in the air, different distances that they can travel, not a black and white thing. Uh, what's your understanding of where the coronaviruses uh, fall in this? Everyone that I hear talk that, that discusses this concept always uh, uh, um, argues that it's large droplet spread Okay. That's uh, the major mediator of uh, disease. I think, unfortunately, people kind of use aerosol interchangeably, especially mass media, right? And it's not right. right. That's correct. Yeah. Right. That's one right. of the reasons I wanted to bring this up, not only for my understanding, but for other people's uh, understanding as well. Because there's a, you know, this really impacts on how you how you think about uh, the transmission. Um, That's so right. So I... Um, uh, I mean, I would assume based on that, that recirculation of air in an aircraft in an aircraft would not necessarily be a huge source of, uh, virus, but, I, uh, but I don't, you know, I don't really, uh, know how air aerosolized or airborne particles behave in that circumstance. But I think of, uh, droplet transmission as something that's not going to stay suspended in the air for very long or over very large distances. I think with SARS, the, uh, the few examples of uh, transmission on an airplane, um, the radius was about six to eight feet from an infected individual. Okay. Mm, okay. So, so not a lot of role for air circulation. That's right. Okay. Uh, of course, this is a new virus. Yeah. Right. We don't know. It's a new day. It's a new day. <laughs> we haven't seen, you know, uh, we haven't seen anything like this. I don't think in a hundred years. Uh, well, cert- eight- cer- certainly, no one has also explained how super how super spreaders infect so so many individuals. True. So, are there ra- are these rare individuals that can un- that can drive um, airborne spread? Do you think it's a matter of dose in a droplet that you get? I thing. think, I think certainly there's there's probably some infectious dose. Mm-hmm. Um, what exactly that is is not clear. But I, but I believe in the in the in Canada, there was one example of a super spreader who simply walked through an emergency room that was packed, that was was fairly packed with individuals and infected 19 people in the less than the 15 seconds they were in the emergency room as they walked through it. Wow, that's like measles. That's like measles. Yeah. So it, uh, has there been, have there been studies done on whether super spreaders uh, oh. uh, have higher titers than others? Oh, I don't know. I'd have to check the literature. I don't... They certainly had documented uh, four or five... Ex- Cases of super spreaders with SARS. I believe the the Saudis have also identified uh, ten to fifteen cases of super spreaders. That they probably have that data. Whether there's sufficient numbers to make it significant um, is is a is an open question. 
Can we talk a little bit about the actual uh, infection? So, you know, there's mild infections, more serious. When people are getting more serious infections, we have pneumonia, I presume the virus is in the lungs. So what's happening when the virus gets down there? So, um, as you as you mentioned, 83% of the cases seem to be mild um, without uh, uh, any requirement for hospitalization. About 17% require uh, ho- that are, are typically uh, could be hospitalized that require some sort of uh, respiratory support. So the virus causes an pneumonia. Uh, the virus uh, specifically it. Um, the most severe cases that develop a disease called acute respiratory distress syndrome are at uh, extremely high risk for lethal infections. And uh, the virus replicates in cells lining the airways, um, especially the smaller airways, as well as the alveoli. Uh, I, although I, there have only been two pathology reports, and so this is based on limited information. Uh, what most likely happens in the alveoli is it destroys type 2 and type 1 cells that line the, the airway uh, epithelium, um, exposing the alveoli to fluids that can diffuse across the capillary beds and result in flooding of the capillary bed, and this results in drowning. In essence, your, your little balloons that transmit oxygen to your red blood, your uh, <coughs> bloodstream, become uh, water balloons, and so you drown mm. in your own fluids. The uh, repair system can also go um, a little bit out of whack. Um, that's a highly, highly Technical refined term. medical term. <laughs> right. Yeah, <I> like it. <laughs> it's, it's out of whack. Yeah, there's a problem. Uh, I like that. And, and uh, <laughs> patients can undergo a profibrotic response where they layer down multiple layers of fibroblast cells um, and the interface and uh, between the alveoli and the uh, capillary bed. And this results in multi-cell thickness layers of cells, and the oxygen now can't diffuse across it to get into the red blood cells to oxygenate your tissue, and now it's death by suffocation. Both cases, you end up with hypoxia that leads to multi-organ failure uh, and then death. It's, and this, uh, is, this is pretty typical viral pneumonia, right? Uh, not all viral pneumonias lead to acute lung injury. Okay. Is this similar to what SARS-1 did? It's, it's exactly the same disease phenotype that SARS and MERS do, okay. as well as H5N1 and H7N9. Mm. So all of these viruses right. cause this similar acute respiratory distress syndrome. The NIH has sp- literally spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to figure out how to uh, treat this end-stage lung disease. Uh, and they've actually done done quite a quite a good job of reducing the mortality rates from fifty percent where it used to be a couple decades ago to about twenty five thirty percent now, but it's still a very very difficult disease to manage clinically. And are we seeing are we seeing people getting secondary bacterial infections with this? No, um, uh, it the cause of death. Uh, seems to be exclusively viral pneumonia leading to acute lung injury uh, without any evidence of secondary bacteri- bacterial infection sequelae. Hmm. Wow. Is, is there a role for in, uh, cytokine storm, say, in any of this pathogenesis? Cytokine storm certainly plays a role in that whole okay. process of uh, acute lung injury, yes. And, and why are kids less than nine not having any of these issues, do we understand? Exactly my question. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. <laughs> They have very high titers of virus. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have. There's no reason. I mean, they they should transmit efficiently to those around us, around them, um, which is re- a good reason why we should close schools to protect right. their parents. Not <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and don't forget their grandparents. Actually, yeah. my, grand, my grandkids right. are with us today. <laughs> That's right, grandparents. Being a grandparent, yes, I'm. I'm, I'm in favor of more grandparents in the world. <laughs> so, we are the spoilers. <laughs> that's right. So that's right. That is our role. Do you, um, do you so, consider a child like that as a super spreader? 
I don't think anyone has done enough work to know the actual burden of spread that's associated with young children uh, at this time in the uh, in the expanding pandemic. I believe that data will be out there, and I be- believe that the contact tracing is occurring. Um, right. That will inform us, uh, but I have not seen the papers. That doesn't mean that they haven't been published yet, but uh, I think we're going to find some ver- uh, very important information about that in the coming months. Uh, why did why did to get back to why children don't don't experience ser- severe disease uh, when they um, examine the lungs of the children by X-ray or other in, uh, non-invasive approaches, they are clearly diseased and they are they are clearly infected and have pathology in their lungs, but they don't show any symptoms. Hmm. Um, why is that? Um, Part of it may be related to uh, the ACE2 molecule, the the receptor for the virus, which plays an important role in homeostasis. Um, But exactly how that uh, could contribute is is not clear. So Hmm. I don't know the answer to uh, the question. I know that the ACE2 level is down function um, of age. I mean, do Um, do they develop fevers? I don't know the answer. I should know the answer okay. to that question, but I don't know the. I, does anyone else on this uh, on the call? I don't. I I don't. the The one thing that I have seen um, from Sally Parmar, who is a um, pediatrician and infectious disease specialist at Duke, um, was that she was speculating that perhaps there were actually physiological differences in children's lungs um, that were causing some of the difference. Um. I was talking to another uh, well-known virologist who was explaining why uh, RSV might be more severe in the lungs of children, and that was because the airways are smaller. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, when the cells of the airway, when the airway epithelial cells slough off, then that clogs the the airways and prevents oxygen exchange. Uh, SARS and uh, this SARS-2 virus grow uh, very well in uh, primary human airway cells, and they cause the airway epithelium cells to slough off. But that would that would have a tendency to drive, you know, based on that hypothesis, then SARS-2 should be causing much more severe disease and obstructive disease in the airways, much like RSV, and that's not what's being seen. So, mm-hmm. okay. uh, I don't know. It's it's a fascinating question. Mm-hmm. But it, it may reflect uh, also the biology of these viruses. Um, in general, coronaviruses infect uh, young children and cause mild disease. Most of us become immune to the contemporary coronaviruses within the first few years of life. And that immunity may well be saving us as adults from uh, viruses that uh, are much like emerging coronaviruses in terms of they have an innate capacity to cause much more severe disease as a function of age. So you're saying there may be cross-reactivities to of some extent between I'm saying that we as a scientific community have have defined contemporary human coronaviruses as mild common cold yeah. diseases, yeah. when in reality, the, all of these emerged from animal reservoirs yeah. 100 to 800 years ago, and we have no idea how severe they were in adult and naive adult populations. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, most likely, they weren't. They were probably brutal diseases just like SARS, MERS, and SARS-2 are Mm -hmm. uh, to adult individuals uh, as they get older. And that actually, if that hypothesis is true, then uh, the prediction would be that as SARS-2 goes around the globe and uh, infects the adult population, we will become immune and the virus will now uh, preserve itself in the population by infecting young children who don't get serious disease. Um, as they grow up, they are pre-immune, and so they never get serious disease. And SARS-2 will now be relegated to the role of being a benign, common, contemporary coronavirus that somehow lost its pathogenic potential. When the real reason it lost its pathogenic potential is that all the dart- adults are now immune. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Um, wow. If that that's the case, then we have a one- to three-year pandemic uh, that we will be facing um, until sufficient herd immunity occurs to drive the virus into this uh, into this ca- this this type of uh, um, persistence mechanism 
mm-hmm. a, a, in uh, human populations. Until the next one comes about. That's right. right. <laughs> and, and, and an important <laughs> thing to note is that there are two human coronaviruses that are in the group one that are very closely related in group one. There are two human coronaviruses in the group 2A uh, phylogenetic grouping that are closely related. And both are both cases, they co-circulate in human populations and don't appear to provide cross immunity. So uh, a single SARS-like virus uh, uh, colonizing the human population will not protect us from another one. Mm. Right. Sounds like good reason to do more research on the whole family of viruses, right? And and to that, I would say we probably didn't learn enough from SARS and MERS because we didn't have enough work going on, or not surveillance and pathogenesis and so forth. Would you agree with that? I would. SARS SARS came and and went so quickly mm. that um, certainly commercial interest. Uh, dropped off uh, at an exponential rate. The virus emerged in 2002, caused 8,000 cases in 2003, and four cases in 2004, and then it was gone. <laughs> and so, so at the same time, at, uh, following that same arc, uh, that was the, the arc of commercial interest, and it was also, to some extent, the arc of um, of um, NIH interest in developing. Uh, vaccines and uh, immunotherapeutics for uh, the shelf that could be used in in future outbreaks. Uh, our own research has shown that there are uh, SARS-like bat strains that vary by at least up to 22 percent, probably up to 35 percent, that are poised to use the human receptors and probably can grow really, really efficiently in primary human airway cells. We know that for a fact with MERS. There are two MERS-like viruses that differ by 35% that can use human DPP-4 receptors and grow to equal titers in primary human airway cells. You know, so you want to ask the question, well, what's, what are the <coughs> biological features and what's the transmissibility pattern and mm-hmm. how transmissible is this other MERS-like strain from China that is 35% different? Is it a SARS-2 in the making or is there something in between that, uh, that, uh, would be perfectly poised to cause a pandemic like SARS-2? And the answer is they're probably out there in nature. And it's just a question of time between before a human, uh, a human comes in contact with the bat that uh, has sufficient titers to allow that individual to be infected. And then that individual go to a location that allows for uh, the spark to start the fire of the next pandemic. So even if you stop the sale of uh, meat at these markets, there will still be contact with humans and bats. So it's that's not, correct. That's not going to. This outbreak could have been caused by a person living in rural China who came in contact with a bat uh, in a bat cave, either collecting guano or doing uh, just by random chance uh, with bats flying over. And uh, they went to Wuhan and they actually started the outbreak without. Uh, without the seeding this thing through an open market setting. And the bats, by the way, who are infected with SARS-like and MERS-like coronaviruses, where is the virus replicating in them and does it cause any problems to them? Most of the data argues that it's an enteric pathogen. Mm. Um, there haven't, there have been, there's been some work done on this um, by, um, I believe, Lin Fa Wang, um, but in general, there hasn't been much in the way of mm. studying a coronavirus replication and pathogenesis in, in bat species. And, and to some extent, that's driven by the fact that you have to have the right type of bat right. to uh, allow for infection. So if it's an enteric virus in bats, then any contact with guano could potentially spread it. That's right. And, and we know it's in guano because m- most of the collection is guano that's taken back to the laboratory. Right where the uh, RNA is then extracted and then used for um, uh, deep sequencing. Uh, what's the status of vaccine development, Ralph? We may have discussed this uh, in the past, but uh, where do we stand? Are there, uh, in particular, are there uh, reasonable uh, candidates out there? Anything from 
SARS that have been in uh, human trials, and I'm also interested at the uh, potential for complications from uh, antigen-dependent uh, enhancement and that causing issues sure. with the vaccines. So I think I, I think there are at least two major candidates that are moving forward rapidly um, towards phase one trials, and one is an RNA-based vaccine. Um, and the other is uh, recombinant protein-based vaccines. Um, the RNA-based vaccines are uh, known to induce a strong Th1 immune response, which is uh, good because um, alum, when alum was adjuvanted with the SARS coronavirus vaccine, it induced a strong Th2 immune response that was associated with large amounts of immune pathology. Uh, the characteristic cells are eosinophils and neutrophils that are seen in especially eosinophils. Although the eosinophils are probably not doing uh, the damage, it's mostly cytokine-based storms. Right. And TNF-alpha and other things, I believe, that are causing most of the tissue damage. But if anybody would like to uh, elaborate on that, I would like to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, by an RNA-based vaccine, we're talking about essentially a messenger RNA encoding a spike protein that's delivered maybe as a, in a lipid nanoparticle or something like that? Is that's that correct? correct? Okay. Yes, I don't know the actual formulation in, in terms of the in terms of the um, <clears throat> the um, delivery the delivery vehicle. Yes, right. Okay. right. That, but that one is probably going to be first to market uh, simply because of the the speed of production of that vaccine, right. and that it's one that's one of the reasons. Correct. That's one of the ones early in trials is that they had this platform, and all they had to do was plug in the sequence and and you know make a bunch of RNA, and now they can go you know, start, uh, start trials. And that hopefully is where kind of vaccine research, uh, at least some of it is going in the long run. Anyway, some sort of platforms that, uh, allow for rapid <laughs> development of vaccines rather than having to mess around with these complicated viruses. Something Very much that, so. Right. That's, yeah. that's true. And we are actually involved in some of those clinical trials. Okay. You're using in terms of the pre pre IND work done in animal models. Yeah. Um, and it's fortunate to hear that they induce the TH1 response that seems to be protective um, in this particular case. That's right. Yes. So there, we have an email which we'll read later, but it's from a, a person who knows about vaccines. And they say that um, if, if this one is licensed in 18 months, that would be a record. Yeah, right. Um, That's right. correct. And, but that's the kind of platform that could be associated with that, although that probably would not impact this current outbreak, right, Ralph? Um, I don't know the uh, – I have not been engaged in the discussions about what the timeline for Phase 1, Phase 2, and Phase 3 testing are. Um, if I were involved in it, I would probably be arguing that we need to have Phase 1 uh, uh, trials that are probably done – uh, in parallel with some of the animal testing mm. and that we try to be positioned to do some type of phase two trial in populations by October, November, so that um, uh, individuals will be um, Im uh, immune prior to the next round of infections. Mm. Uh, so how about the complication of antibody dependent enhancement? I have heard that there have uh, been some observations in animal models that uh, uh, this phenomenon of mm, poor immunity winding up uh, enhancing a real infection, uh, something like it has been observed in animal models. And that seems to me it could complicate uh, the vaccine development, recalling the respiratory syncytial virus uh, vaccine that failed because it enhanced uh, disease uh, from natural infection. Or the dengue vaccine. Or the dengue vaccine. Oh. The dengue vaccine is a good example of ADE. Uh, the RSV vaccine, I think, was mostly TH2 driven immune pathology. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the classic example in a coronavirus with ADE is feline infectious peritonitis virus. And the FIPV vaccines induce a antibody response that allows uh, the, uh, the antibody coats the virus and allows for more efficient infection of macrophages and monocyte cell populations. And this results in much more severe disease. The um, 
the the SARS data and SARS data is much more controversial. Uh, there are a couple of reports of people being able to use to demonstrate antibody enhancement of inf uh, infection of monocytes or reporter actually reporter cells it's ex expressing FC receptors with various antibodies in cell culture. There's been one report uh, in primates of an ADE-like phenomena that was reported in China but has not been replicated anywhere. And um, so uh, the community, uh, I would have, in general, the community is speculative. It is, the ADE phenomena is more speculative and probably controversial. Okay. Having said that, they clearly have to look for it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. So, so that's uh, one of those things that you might look for in animal models. Yes. Um, do we have good animal models for this uh, viral infection? Right now, the only real animal model is a human ACE2 transgenic mouse. Um, they were made in probably three laboratories, four laboratories around the world back around 2004 to 2006. Most were cryopreserved. Um, they were the the ACE2 molecule was either expressed from um, a CMV promoter or tissue specific lung promoters. Didn't really matter too much. Um, the co the consequences of this were the same. Uh, the virus would replicate in the lung, and around day six, it goes to the brain and causes a fatal encephalitis. Uh, so we have one of those models. Um, uh, we had uh, sent it a couple of years back to uh, a group of investigators in at the Institute of Virology in Wuhan, and they have a paper that uh, they've just recently submitted on this model um, that I'm also an author on. So uh, that model, that paper is under review. Um, so I remember with SARS, you had to mouse adapt the virus to infect those transgenics. Is that correct? That's correct. Same with SARS-CoV-2? With SARS-2, will not replicate in mice. We've tried collaborative cross mice, mm -hmm. immunodeficient mice, wild type, regular laboratory mice. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, if you look at the interface of the receptor binding domain of this virus to its receptor, there are uh, specific residues that would be predicted to convert the SARS-2 strain to a mouse-adapted strain if you use reverse genetics. Mm. I remember when the first paper came out of the Wuhan lab, they had a bunch of cells where they had put in human ACE2 and the mouse cells that did not replicate. That's correct. And the human and the bat and some others did. So I said, up oh, problem for a transgenic model, right? Yeah. Right. So I know that some groups are developing uh, knock-ins. Mm -hmm. um, we're probably... We're, we're, our approach is to use the existing human ACE2 transgenic mouse model in the lab, as well as uh, working towards mouse adapted strains. All right, it's been an hour, Ralph. Any any quick questions from anyone before we say goodbye? No. All right, really appreciate it, Ralph. That's this was awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Totally I learned excellent. so much. Thank yes. you so yes. much. Yes, this is great. Well, you're all being very generous. It's a pleasure to talk with you all. <laughs> Uh, and Ralph, and I great. Hope, hope you have a great weekend and stay safe and uh, support your local efforts at um, implementing public health barrier approaches to prevent the spread of the disease. Yeah, yep. here. good point. And Ralph, doing it. will you come back again? Oh, sure. I will do. I'll be glad to. Okay. Thanks a lot, Ralph. Bye bye. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Take Ralph. See you. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Wow, I'm blown away. I'm still thinking about what he said about uh, establishment potentially in some other animal reservoir. Spill that back. really got me. Spill yes. back. Yeah. Huh? Mm -hmm. Spill back. Yeah. Spill it's, back. it's very interesting. Um, but we have other issues right now, right? Yes. <laughs> other coronavirus issues. <laughs> uh, it's just, I mean, in the U S it's just getting started really. Right. So uh, yeah. we have a ways to go. Yes. All right. And we have a lot of email, but I wanted to touch on just a few things very briefly. First is there is a paper submitted to New England Journal. You can find it on Med Archive. So we have BioArchive and Med Archive, another place to check, but that's fine. 
And it's all about the how long infectivity uh, lasts in various situations. This comes out of uh, Rocky Mountain Labs, Vincent Munster's group, and, and also people at Princeton and UCLA. So they looked at SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1, and they measure infectious virus, and they look at both detection limits and half-lives in aerosols. And these are all generated in the laboratory, so it's an artificial aerosol. I don't know how fine the particles are, but, you know. They, they mention it briefly in the methods. Yeah. Um, I spent some time looking at the methods, and they mentioned something about uh, particle sizes, but they also talk about how it was made in a Goldberg drum, and I don't couldn't figure out what a Goldberg drum was. Right. Mm. <laughs> All right. Well, it, they make an aerosol, or they put the virus on various surfaces like copper, cardboard, steel, and plastic, and they say what's the half life of infectivity and what's the detection limit. And I was talking to a reporter this morning, and I gave her all these numbers, and she said, that doesn't mean anything to me. What's the bottom line? (laughs) Bottom line is, it lasts long enough to transmit in an aerosol or on surfaces. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line. And it lasts longer on some surfaces than on others. It seems to last longest on plastic and steel, um, not quite as long on cardboard, not very long on copper, and only a few hours as an aerosol. Yeah. And the, not, indef- and not indefinitely. No. Not indefinitely, no. This is all, it's, it drops below the detection limit after uh, the longest was 72 hours on plastic, right? Yeah. And and it was interesting, um, they compared, since they're comparing um, new SARS to classic SARS here, um, <laughs> the, uh, the new SARS lasts longer on in most of these assays. Right. Speaking, right. speaking of classic SARS, that... Kind of reminds me of classic rock, right? Yeah. Well, my wife told me now. She, my wife listens to Sirius, and there's a coronavirus channel on Sirius XM. Oh, <laughs> what do they play? Well, they don't play. They talk for all time. Talk. Oh, okay. Got it. They just play interviews with people. They should play we Twib. We should be on there. They I know. Yeah. I know. They don't want us, but, well, they, I don't know if they want us or not, but they should. In fact, yeah. the Columbia radio station should be playing Twibs 24-7, but. I think yeah, right. I, I think that that last hour with Ralph is probably the most informative thing we've ever done. That was incredible. Right. That was, that that, was in a lot. I think yeah. that with Daniel Griffin last week on the clinical aspects. Yes, that was Because yes. he deals with stuff that we don't know anything about. Yeah, I would yeah. say that this past hour with Ralph, the episode with Daniel, and the previous episode with Ralph are where I feel like I've learned most of what I know. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so with Ralph, so, do you think we should grandfather clause him in? He's Alan, a grandfather. Oh, I get, it. I get it. To, yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things that, uh, just as an aside, interests me about this uh, stability uh, paper, and this is a phenomenon that's been known for some time, which is why they test it, is that uh, things don't like, uh, pathogens don't like <laughs> copper. Right. That's right. It would mm-hmm. it would make sense to make everything in hospitals out of copper. <laughs> out of copper. Or, yeah, well, at least, at least high traffic things like bed rails yeah. and doorknobs. And right. that's what right. Michael Schmidt is doing he does clinical trials to assess the effect of lining these surfaces in hospitals on copper and it certainly brings down uh, hospital acquired infections we did yesterday on twim actually a paper uh, published a couple years ago on coronavirus 229e one of these um, coronas that cause common colds and on copper the, the infectivity is lost like in seconds when you put it on wow. the copper, wow. it, when it's mixed with mucus, I think it really inactivates it. And so it's quite antimicrobial and antiviral. So, yeah. so just make your clothes out of copper. That's right. Just go around <laughs> it in copper armor. And uh... there you go. Uh, so then there's the nice paper in the Lancet that I saw this, uh, this week where they studied a number of cases in China. And they said, what are the biggest comorbidity risks? for getting very serious disease. And the biggest risks risk are hypertension, diabetes, and coronary heart disease. Which right. is like half the American population. Exactly. And so in China, the patients who died typically or had the most serious disease had those issues. And I think for me, that's the driving issue right now. Not that there'll be a lot of infections, because as Ralph said, 83% of them are mild. But the most serious ones need hospitalization. And we don't have enough... ICU beds 
to take care of people if we suddenly get millions and millions of cases, right? Right. right. Well, and that's the logic of canceling everything because yeah. if we can, you know, yeah, it may be that everybody's eventually going to get exposed to this or 70% of the population is eventually going to get exposed. But if that happens next week, then we're going to have a problem. If that happens over a period of a couple of months, yeah, exactly. then it's going to be a slower trickle of people going into the hospital. And by the time they need the bed, it's emptied out from the previous person and they'll be able to handle the, the capacity. So that's trying to slow it down is a, a big emphasis now. Yes, exactly. Hashtag flatten the curve. Yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then there was a Lancet article this week for, uh, Maybe today out of Italy, where they predict 30,000 cases next week, and that will completely saturate their ICU bed capacity, which they don't. Well, there are 15,113 15, right now. I'm looking at the Johns Hopkins site. Yeah. So just have to double it. And that's why the, the mortality rate is so high. If you can't handle the patients, they will die, right? And yeah. if you can give them good health care— just like the Ebola outbreak, right? When they came to the U.S., they survived. It's a similar situation. So, and, you know, and Italy been, is Italy is reputed to have a, a pretty good healthcare system. They do, and they're getting they overwhelmed. Do. But they don't have enough ICU beds. As I said, we have ninety-five thousand here in the U.S., and you know that's uh, ten million cases would saturate that, right? Am I doing? Yeah. If it were one percent, I think that's right. Yeah, I think so. All right, you want to do some email? Sure. 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 All right. So I'll just take uh, Anne's who writes a link to a link with comprehensive info about COVID-19 or world and data. Yes, this is a very nice site with lovely statistics of all sorts of things, not just COVID-19. I use it for polio and HIV and AIDS and so forth. So that's really nice. And and uh, then I'll take Volker's. Here are my current questions, not yet answered by your incredible, useful service to the public. Pretty early in the year, it was mentioned that retrospective analysis had identified a COVID case not linked to the fish market. Oh, so any updates about where the virus came from? Is it the fish market? So Ralph said, we don't know. Mm. Right. We, yeah, it, it may not have been from the fish market. It may have gone into the fish market and then spread there. Yeah. And just, Ralph right. outlined the scenario that was very realistic of somebody in rural China catching this directly from a bat and then going to Wuhan and bringing it there mm-hmm. and... I mean, maybe it was even a farmer at the market who, you know, then went in and spread it to people at the market. Um, we just, we don't know. Right. And Go ahead. The, the data that was meant that this person mentions about the retrospective analysis um, about a case in early December not connected to the fish market is still the data that I reference yeah. um, when yes. talking about this. Yep. Now you said, how do you interpret the evolution in China? Is there already an effect of herd immunity due to earlier spread? And I would say... We don't know, as as Ralph said, because they're only reporting in the quarantine zones. So we don't right. know what's going on elsewhere. Right now, there are just like 10 or less cases a day in China. and Reported. 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 And mm-hmm. apparently, they're resuming slowly life as usual. If there isn't a lot of herd immunity, there will be another outbreak. I would right. think so. And then he said, could you cover the effects of potentially overwhelmed health systems? Well, we are not uh, experts about that, but yes, that's a problem, and that's the main concern right now, which is hap- which happened in Wuhan early on, which happened in Italy and Iran, in contrast to South Korea, yeah. where the fatality is less than 1%. And probably a big part of South Korea's success was that they took it very seriously very early yes. and implemented implemented the, the sort of uh, self-quarantine, social distancing type of protocols immediately. Um, mm-hmm. And they, they weren't, I gather, being a democracy, they weren't quite as draconian about it as China was, but they were they were proactive and got on top of things early, and that <clears throat> gave them a flatter curve that allowed them to deal with what was happening, and also they have an excellent health care system. Situation in Munich, far too warm for mid-March. Schools will be closed from next Monday. Companies are training or already implementing emergency plans in the shops. You miss three things. Disinfectants, noodles, toilet paper. <laughs> Again, we with the toilet some paper. Noodles, I think. Yeah, but we're out of yeah. toilet paper, too. Oh, no. We are actually out of all three of those things in the oh, right? supermarket here in New Jersey. What's yep, with the noodles? Exactly the same. Is that like I a staple? Be- I think quick it's because they, it's a quick meal that also is going to uh, well. keep well. Keep well. 
Yeah. Yep. Okay. Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Josh writes, Dear Twiv Doctors, uh, I've been enjoying your recent coverage of the coronavirus and wanted to ask a question. Is it possible this coronavirus has been in circulation in the U.S. for a time already and we are only now seeing cases because we're testing for them when we were not beforehand? Please forgive this question. It has been asked previously. Please forgive if this has been asked previously. Um, and I can guarantee that it was here before we started getting positive tests. I, uh, given mm-hmm. given the rate at which testing was being done early on in the U.S. and the um, uh, the the res- the testing response by I- I'm sorry I'm, I know we have listeners at the CDC and there are a lot of good people there doing their best but um, the CDC testing early in this was just just not up to snuff. I think and, the and, first infection was Washington in January, right? In the U.S. Yeah, I think so. So yeah, there there's been some data where people have looked at the sequence of virus from some of the patients in yeah. Washington, and tried to determine how long the virus was circulating, how many mm. differences um, had happened, and it looked like the virus had been there about six weeks at that point. Right, for sure. Yeah, so it was it was here well before we knew it, and we have not handled this well at all as as a country um and then uh, josh finishes on a lighter note i told my colleagues that i was going to quit my job and follow twiv on their tour around the world they just said what's twiv and that's part of the problem (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) have a failure to communicate (laughs) but the twiv tour around the world has been postponed yes no we're not having tours for sure um what was i going to ask we're still not testing enough right no, no you know, we're not we're not i mean states are starting to take over so here our governor has implemented and gotten testing by private companies and as i said he's we're starting drive through testings here that's great so basically if you're a state you should do it on your own because you're not getting federal guidance sadly yeah brian can you take the next one sure cindy writes along with being a longtime twix lover I'm a police officer in a small New England town. Our resources aren't as sophisticated as I would imagine population centers are. I'm usually the only officer in my town when I'm working and I get dispatched to every emergency medical call. For a typical emergency, say heart attack, I would get radioed about the situation at the same time as fire and rescue and will drive right there. The on-call EMTs would drive to the fire station, get their gear and the ambulance and drive to the call. I arrive alone to the medical call, usually 10 to 15 minutes prior to them. I carry a small oxygen tank with bag valve mask, nasal cannula, and a non-rebreather, an AED, a few tourniquets, and some Narcan. PPE is non-latex gloves and a Glock 22. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. That's good. I'm only a couple of years on the job, but doing chest compressions already resulted in a save for me along with multiple times I kept people with opioid overdoses breathing until medical arrived. Good job. I've also provided care to young and old dying people who probably had contagious disease. I'm left to do my best and maybe use some hand sanitizer before I get back in my cruiser. I don't even have access to a clothes washer at the police department, so uniforms are coming home to get washed. In in an ideal world, all smaller police departments would be prepared for this outbreak, but we certainly are not. What should I plan for as far as calls? I can imagine a lot of struggling to breathe and non-responsive with a pulse patients. Other than being completely horrified by my situation, is there anything you can recommend I do to protect myself? to protect the next person I go help. Am I wrong to be kind of resigned to the idea that I will be exposed and will just have to deal with that and try not to be a source myself? Thanks, Cindy. Uh, Just a brief personal perspective here. My sister is a paramedic in um, New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, And my wife, by the way, is working in an emergency room in Connecticut um, now as a doctor. Um, But I, I, my first suggestion would be to, Talk to the EMTs and see if you can borrow some extra uh, gloves and maybe maybe masks from them if they have them, um, although those are in real short supply. Um, and 
and do the best you can. I, I don't think you're wrong to be resigned to the idea that you'll get exposed. Yeah. I yeah, think I as, a, as a frontline first responder, um, I, I'm sorry, that's, that's going to happen. So you don't yeah, think your best, should, your uh, best protection is going to be immunity in the long run, I think. Yeah. So she shouldn't be wearing a face mask. You think? <laughs> I, I, I think if available, maybe she should, I, because she's a first responder. She's going to be, yeah, sure. going to be right coughing. down there with the aerosol. She's going to be right down there with mm -hmm. them and, you know, running into, into these situations where, um, you know, she's got the right PPE for a police officer. I'm glad to hear that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, you know, do what you can to avoid getting coughed on. I mean, that sounds kind of silly. If you're going to be performing CPR on somebody, you do what you can. Right. Um, but I think but she's young and probably won't have a serious infection. Yeah, if you're if you're uh, you know you're young, you're uh, you're a police officer, so you've met the physical standards for that. You um, probably will not have an issue with this. But I I applaud your concern about exposing the next person mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. respond mm -hmm. to, which is a very appropriate and valid concern. I think under the circumstances, there's probably not a lot to be done that you're not already doing. If we have anyone listening who knows who works in this area, please let us know. Yes, the I would say. Go ahead. Oh, I was would just say, Cindy, uh, thank you for all that you're doing. Yes, um, and, and I'm you. sorry yes. that I don't have Absolutely. something that we don't have something um, sort of fabulous to tell you here. Yeah, uh, I, I I love that we that we've got a police officer in a small New England town listening yes. to to Wiv. I just think that's mm -hmm. great, and the image I have in my mind, it won't go away as Fargo. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes I was thinking exactly the same and thing. She did a great job, by the way. Maybe she's <laughs> in your town, Alan. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, it, it, you're right. you're a small New England town, right? We're a small New England town. That's that's my kind of place. Dixon, can you take the next one? I'd be happy to. Nicholas writes, Dear Twivsters, my name is Nicholas Westenheiner. I am a GP from southern Germany, and the coronavirus pandemic brought me to your podcast. At first, I want to thank you. It is a pleasure to listen to you. I go to work by bicycle every twice a day, and so I have about 40 minutes of time to listen to all this important information. By the way, we have about 5 degrees Celsius and mostly cloudy weather conditions. My question is about the testing procedure. I don't really know how this RT-PCR thing works, and today I got a text which said that it is possible that there is a lot of false positive tests now in Italy and Germany. In this text, they speculate that all these tests do not use a specific SARS-CoV-2 test kit, but a more general coronavirus test kit for this RT-PCR. The conjecture is that it is not possible to produce so many specific test kits for uh, SARS-CoV-2 in such a short time. What do you think about this? Thanks, and keep on twiving. I think you can make a lot of test kits. It's not a problem. I, Germany has great tech. You could definitely. Why don't do we it. do that? We're, we can do it. We can do it. Why don't we do it? I didn't say we can't do it. I, why, why, why don't we do it? There was a rather disturbing NPR investigative report that suggested it one explanation, but I won't get into it because we'll be accused of getting political. <laughs> All right. right. Uh, yes, I, w I would say that, Nicholas, um, while there might be some questions of some things being in short supply, those things are not what would tell you the difference between SARS-CoV-2 and other coronaviruses. Yeah, um, the, right. the parts that are specific for SARS-CoV-2 are pretty easy to make in large quantities. Very quickly. easy to make, yes. So if you go to the WHO website, they have all suggested primers, and there are certainly pan-corona primers and SARS-CoV-2 specific, right? So, yep. and that's what you should be using now because otherwise you're not going to get the information you need. It would right, be so unusual we'll to find the, the, it would the be primary. Unusual. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Rich. It would be unusual to find another COV circulating through those two countries and nowhere else. Given no, the, I think uh, there are. I think they're the seasonal ones that Ralph was seasonal, talking about. Yeah. Regular coronaviruses, right. But uh, I don't know why anybody would be producing regular coronavirus test kits who's capable of producing coronavirus <laughs> test kits yeah, right exactly. now. Right, right, yeah. right, right. The, right. the entire yeah. emphasis is going to be on this. And the primers are the, um, they're sort of the, the active ingredient in a PCR test. They're going to, they're going to 
find the specific sequence that you're looking for. Um, so it is possible that somebody dug out some old kits and used them. It's exceedingly unlikely, especially in a country like Germany or in Italy, that any significant number of those is generating large numbers of false positives and somehow skewing the statistics. Mm-hmm. Right. I, it doesn't right. seem believable. The, the, you know, for the Caleb's out there, the uh, RT-PCR test is uh, in uh, maybe the simplest explanation I can give is it's a, a way of asking whether the RNA sequence that is um, diagnostic of this particular virus is present in a sample. And the way that's the, the critical reagent for that is is the RNA sequence itself that's there for the purpose of comparison, saying the kit has the RNA sequence in there effectively and says, uh, uh, let's compare this to this sample and see if it's there. It's obviously a lot more complicated than that, but it's not, um, that's, that's it in theory. And it's a very, very common, uh, procedure. So if you got the kit, uh, and a minimal amount of training, you ought to be able to run the, run the test. Rich, can you take the next one? Brenner writes, hi, Twiv team. Long-time listener, I started in academics after a PhD and a postdoc. I went into public health. I hear in the podcast that there isn't much information on the current COVID-19, or as I prefer to call it, sars 2 cov test. So let me give you the background. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I could have shut up. The <laughs> CDC originally came out with a real-time reverse transcription PCR, RT-RT-PCR. Uh, it had three targets, all in the end gene. Uh, why the uh, end gene when everybody else uses spike? Your guess is as good as mine. And she gives a link. Uh, they sent out, <clears throat> uh, they sent the test out to 99 different public health labs. Uh, of the 99, only five could make the assay work. 94 labs uh, could have uh, could have the N3 probe could have the N3 probe react to something uh, in the HSC late in the reaction, causing a late positive CT for the HSC probe too. That's getting a little dense, <laughs> uh, but um, basically they got. Uh, uh, test didn't work. The CDC said they were going to replace false positives. <laughs> false positives. CDC said that they, they were going to replace just the N3 primer probe set, but that the other two should be good to go. A week passed. The CDC was still working on it. Were they going to change the sequence? No one knew what the problem was. However, in situations like this, laboratories cannot just adjust a protocol. We are required by CLIA, FDA, and every other alphabet soup agency to do the test right. exactly as it is written. You Correct. can't homebrew this. Right. A second week passed, and in a very surprising turn of events, the Associate of Public Health Laboratories, who worked very closely with the CDC getting a myriad of assays and programs up and running, wrote a harsh letter to the FDA asking them to loosen requirements for emergency authorized testing. Days afterwards, the CDC said you only had to use the first two N primer probe sets. They remanufactured and sent new lots out to all the labs in about a week. And basically, we never speak of the N3 primer probe again. She gives a link to this for information. Testing requires both a doctor and an epidemiologist. In testing like this, there has to be an epidemiologist sign-off. A doctor cannot just order the test. Even with the loosening of the rules, there is paperwork that an epidemiologist is required to fill out and approve before we can initiate testing. Granted, a doctor has a great deal of sway, which reminds me of a story. About a year ago, there was a small mers cov outbreak in the Middle East as there is now, it was still flu season. I was working for the Laboratory Response Network in Texas at the time. The, uh, this network, the LRN, is the lab that hospital labs go to when they can't rule out a bio-threat agent. Mm-hmm. So I get a call after work. Does our lab do mers cov testing? No, we didn't. Who did? Uh, the neatest, the nearest big city or state capital lab. Okay, well, they're going to send over a sample that is suspected of MERS-CoV for flu testing. 
uh, and we need to be ready to handle it. Our hospital lab was very concerned about taking a potential uh, MERS-CoV sample and running it over their nice new flu PCR machine. <laughs> Understandable. But after several meetings, uh, we go through various safety options and decon methods, and they're ready. We run the sample, and it's flu A positive. I grab an aliquot of the sample and take it back to our lab to do the CDC flu panel, which generates uh, a type, uh, a type and subtype. I run the PCR AH3. I so same thing. It's flu. I later asked the original referring hospital for more patient information. Turns out that this patient also had a rapid antigen flu A positive uh, result about 12 hours before we got anything. While all this was going on, they shipped a sample to the Austin lab to get tested, but even uh, with it being cold outside, they didn't pack it in enough cold packs, so the sample arrived melted and was considered unsuitable for testing. So they got a new sample, packed it in dry ice, and flew it by helicopter to Austin to get it test tested, all because the doctor said the patient was, quote, too sick for just the flu. So, after quite a bit of extra effort, the samples was finally tested for MERS-CoV. It was found to be negative. My advice to all physicians, if a patient is flu positive, they have the flu. <laughs> <laughs> As a side note, uh, and you don't have to read this, is I'm not interested in fear-mongering. I didn't do my PhD on coronaviruses. Coronaviruses uh, are much like polio in the Perez in the uh, presence and use of quasi-species to determine pathogenesis. There are reports of quasi-species playing a role in pathogenesis. There are neurotropic coronaviruses. They are mouse in origin, but they were selected from a strain that infects the lungs when cultured properly. So it is quite possible that the quasi-species diversity of the infecting virus and the diversity generated throughout infection can impact intestinal uh, infection as well as neurotropism and gives a couple of links to that concept. Thanks for the great podcast. Uh, and if you hear, ooh, ooh, pick me, I know, it's probably me yelling at the podcast. <laughs> Elbow bumps. And his name is not Horshack. Right. Nice. Now that's Brenna. <laughs> yeah, there are some well, neurotropic coronas, but not these are not known to be neurotropic. And Brenna, thank you very much for the insight on the the CDC test and what went on with that, because that was that was enlightening. Yep, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would, I would, I would like to. I, I don't want to do it myself, but I would like to go through and shake down the CDC. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, they, they, uh, they, they, I, I, I think, I think they. Uh, well, I got, I got people who work there. It's a great organization. We really need it. They do great work, but I think they need some. I think they need some help and some. I uh, will, you know, I will revision. merely point out, without getting political, that they, they did recently have a management change at the top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to set that out there, and people can look into whatever they want to look into and figure out. The the director was asked today who's directing the diagnostic COVID-2 issue, and he didn't know. And so now yeah. they've just appointed someone to do that. And I find it very interesting, and uh, I'm thankful for it, that the really the public uh, face of this is uh, Tony Fauci. Yes. I mean, it, uh, it, it, it should be. At that's least true. equally, the CDC director, but it's Tony Fauci, and that's appropriate. Yep. That's good. Yes. You know, under the circumstances, and, and he's a great person to have in that position. Absolutely, sure. absolutely. All right, and ben. he isn't afraid to be critical. Yes. All right, Ben writes, "Hi, Twiv team. On your brief discussion on airplane air recirculation, I thought I would bump in and say that while the air is brought in from outside, not enough air is brought in. It is expensive to bring in minus sixty C air heat at the cabin temp, so airlines." <laughs> Try to keep it to a minimum in terms of percent oxygen, percent carbon dioxide. Airplane air is now less fresh than when it was when people could smoke on planes 
because they brought in much more air to get rid of visible pollution. <laughs> well, the cabin air was obviously more carcinogenic than I would think less air from outside. Higher CO2 could mean greater transmission potential. Thanks for all your fantastic work. You're really providing the public with level-headed information in a time of mania. Regards from a toilet paper deficient <laughs> South Australia. <laughs> wow. It's global. It's a global problem. <clears throat> well, as, as uh, Ralph said, the transmission seems to be really, in airplanes, really close around to the people sitting around you. But mm-hmm. So it's still not a good idea to fly because you got all these people sitting there for what could be hours, right? Yes. Unless you're the only person in the plane and you're flying it. Yes. Like right. you, so right? Helen, do the, do the people in the cockpit get the same air as the passengers? Yes. Well, then you should start doing studies on pilots because they're an older bunch of people to begin with. That's uh, well, they're, they're a stringently health-screened bunch of people. That's true. So they, They're, to, they're to at class, risk. They're highly at risk. They, they are at risk, but to get a Class A medical and fly for the airlines, you, you do have to pass a, um, an actual... Well, no, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that they're immunocompromised or anything. I'm just saying that they're an older group of people. Well, they're, yeah, well, but they are also, certainly... Certainly, they they could catch the virus and transmit it. Right. Uh, there are good tests for this sort of uh, aerosol airborne thing because they're locked exactly. off in the cockpit exactly. and mm-hmm. getting exactly. the circulating yeah. air. That's true. You know? That's a good point. Uh, that's what I was. Alan, could you of. take the next one? Sure. No name writes. Uh, that's probably not their real name. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but anyway, a hi, no, good to meet you. Uh, hey, hey, guys, not really a question, but more of a comment. There were a lot of questions about masks and their utility on episode 590. While I understand people wanting answers to these questions, at this point, it's largely academic, as they are just not available anywhere. Also, as Rich pointed out, a lot of people are probably not going to use them correctly, like the woman he was sitting next to on his recent flight. To make matters worse, this lack of availability is probably going to have an impact on healthcare workers and first responders, which, for obvious reasons, is not good. Something to think about, at least from my point of view. And yeah. this would probably be a good time to discuss masks, right? Yeah, it's a good time. Yeah. I think those are the reasons why they're not recommended by CDC. You yeah. need them for healthcare workers, and they're not enough, right? Yeah, I think right. that that's probably true. Um, I also kind of think about the fact that I have a hard enough time not touching my face. Um, yes. And I'm sure that if I had something on my face annoying me, I'd be touching it even more often. <laughs> I think that's the other issue is that people are not wearing them correctly, which I, I'd like to point out. Uh, Daniel Griffin's group put out a video this weekend for healthcare workers, but it's good for everyone on how to don and doff personal protective wear and um, we'll put a link to that in the show notes it's really very good does he have the glock 22 in it (laughs) (laughs) no no that is not a healthcare worker thing that's a Ah, a police officer thing Uh, and there we've actually been discussing uh, among the twiv group on slack uh, in the past week a couple of papers you can you can kind of pick your data depending on what you want to argue but a couple of papers from 2004 um, including one in the CDC journal, Emerging Infectious Diseases. One argues that, um, uh, you know, presents some data from the original SARS epidemic in uh, Beijing in 2003 and shows that people who did wear a mask had a, had a lower risk of contracting SARS. Mm. Um, they also found other things that correlated with that, which included um, like people washing their hands when they first came home, uh, owning a pet, visiting a farmer's market. These were all protective. So I think there's a lot going on there besides masks uh, that probably has to do with uh, people's personal habits and who was more conscientious about social distancing and that kind of thing. And then there's a another paper that I think Kathy provided in the discussion that's also from Emerging Infectious Diseases, also from 2004. Um, and this was a study on nurses in Toronto. Um that found uh, there was a, um, I'm always a little annoyed by this phrase, that the risk was reduced by consistent use of a surgical mask, but not significantly. Mm. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. Um, statistics note, if something was not reduced significantly, it was not reduced. Um, so <laughs> yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um, we also had some recent conversations about masks um, here because we've realized that there are so many different cultural beliefs about masks um, and some uh, people seem to get a lot of security out of them. Um, and so um, whether or not you choose to wear a mask sort of shouldn't involve how you feel about others who have decided to wear them. Yeah. Unless they've decided to wear a hockey mask. 
in public. True, you should, true. You can draw some conclusions about that, I think. That that that's true. I I agree with you there. Today uh, is Friday the thirteenth, by the way. Oh, it is. That's right. <laughs> it is Friday the thirteenth. Uh Brienne, can you take the next one? Sure. Jody writes, Greetings, Twiv High Council. <laughs> First of all, a brief but tremendous thank you for your reading and responding to my email a few weeks back. I can't begin to express the heart-bursting joy I felt at hearing your thoughtful advice and consideration on how to tackle getting started on my ID career midlife. I now have a juicy list of docs in Seattle to target and will be doing so this year and feel genuinely bolstered by your encouragement. I would also like to give a shout out to Matt Doherty of the Doherty Lab at UCSD, who sat in my backyard five and a half years ago telling me about chikungunya over beers. When he saw the light in my eyes and the froth build at my mouth to know more, he said, you know, there's a podcast. You might have a rabies exposure. Oh, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) And here we are today. As a virology enthusiast, this is an exciting time. All of a sudden, everyone wants to talk about viruses. (laughs) where I usually am allocated only a few minutes of each conversation with friends and husband to bore them with my giddy ramblings about what I recently learned on Twix or read about whichever history of disease book I happen to currently be devouring. The exception is my seven-year-old daughter, who regularly asks that we stop reading 15 minutes early each night so that we can talk about viruses. She wants to do one each night. I have some more reading to do. I like her daughter. Yes. A professional podcaster friend actually asked me to meet up this weekend so I could help her prepare for a coronavirus-focused episode she was recording the next day with her co-host in Italy. We spent almost four hours talking viruses in general and SARS-CoV-2 in particular, (laughs) and I shared scores of articles, papers, reports harvested from your episode links over the last month. It was a hoot. She had just gotten off a plane and kept coughing and sneezing. Her husband and I did our best to maintain a meter's distance from her though our beers were collecting respiratory droplets. We debated whether she should wash her hands before or after using the ketchup, both. And we all tapped feet and elbows lovingly when we said goodbye at the end of the night. As you scientists like to say, so. So, as the outbreak situation in Seattle is rapidly evolving and my friends, family, spouse are all coming to me, not a virologist or epidemiologist or public health professional of any kind, and asking, what should we do? I thought I would write to you with some updates about what is happening here and as, what should we do? Since learning that experts believe that the virus has likely been circulating undetected here in Washington State for over a month, people have gone into action. Currently, there is a bit of an apocalypse confessible atmosphere in this city. For the last four days or so, people have been packing Costco and local grocery stores like it's the day before Thanksgiving or the Super Bowl. And by 3 p.m., the shelves are cleared of canned food and toilet paper. (laughs) I feel like toilet paper is a theme today. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Our local Trader Joe's reported record sales this past weekend, and every drugstore in my neighborhood has signs taped in the window saying, we are sold out of face masks and hand sanitizer. Everyone is very concerned and prepping like crazy, but laughing and joking at the same time. (laughs) Yesterday, I had so many lighthearted conversations with chipper strangers about how many boxes of mac and cheese would last 30 days, which (laughs) wine might go best to the apocalypse, (laughs) etc. I would like to know the answer to that question. Yes. Um, People are actively preparing, but decidedly not panicking. Good. Good. That said, our governor and county executive have both declared states of emergency. Large companies like F5 and REI have closed campuses temporarily, and Facebook and T-Mobile have taken measures to limit who is coming through their doors. A number of schools have closed. King County is in the process of buying a motel to house patients who need to be isolated, and the city is setting up modular units to treat and house the infected among our homeless population, which is the third largest in the U.S. and numbers over 5,000 people. A local immigration office has closed for 14 days due to an exposure, and scores of firefighters are in quarantine after being exposed at the Kirkland Care Center that has become the epicenter of the local outbreak. Those are all really great things to hear. I have been following all along in real time as you have speculated about possible outcomes and looked at local and national containment efforts with a critical eye. So my big question for you is, 
Now that it seems clear that there is an infectious prodrome and there are likely perhaps hundreds of asymptomatic people or very minorly symptomatic people who think they have a cold, uh, out shedding virus and coming into contact with scores of others every single day, what should, steps should we be taking to stop this outbreak in its tracks? I've heard you criticize quarantine and travel bans, but I've also read the early identification, quarantine, and citizens changing their daily behavior haven't been effective in stopping other outbreaks. Our governor in a press conference yesterday urged social distancing and suggested that working from home when sick could be seen as a patriotic act. I like this idea, but it's obviously a luxury of an office worker and not something that can be done if you're in a service or manufacturing job that you will lose if you don't show up. And only working from home while sick does not solve the problem of the asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic shutter who might be working at a school or riding a bus or working out in a gym every day. I think all of those are, are very good points. Um, I think that there are that um, a lot of what we're doing with social distancing is great, but um, we do need to think about those who are not going to be able to do so. Yep. Um, so if this continues to spread, should we close schools for a month? Yep. Should everyone shelter in place for a month, which is what the city is planning for with their hoarding of canned bees and toilet paper? <laughs> should every business that is able ask their employees to work remotely? Yep. How does one yes. stop a virus like this that is often causing such mild symptoms from spreading in a big city? Will following the advice of washing our hands and cell phones and not shaking hands keep us all safe? Or is this like Bush's Homeland Security telling us that we all need to protect ourselves in case of a <laughs> biological or chemical terrorist attack with duct tape and plastic sheeting? Uh, Hand washing say, yeah. is more effective than duct tape and plastic sheeting. Yeah. Hand washing, staying home, all of those things I think are going to be important. Can I just interject? Of course. So we were critical of quarantine and travel restrictions because... Early on, we felt that the infection should spread and confer herd immunity. But then we learned of the high uh, f serious complication rate in a certain percentage of infections and the possibility that that would overwhelm the healthcare system. And we saw that happen in Wuhan and Italy. And for that reason, I think we should reduce the transmission to keep the hospitals able to function because they can save people's lives. And so I think all of these restrictions are absolutely right. good to do I, right now. And, and I, I would too. just, as, as somebody who's also been particularly critical of quarantine and travel restrictions in the past, um, I want to draw a distinction between mandatory quarantines and trying to arrest people in place and voluntary cancellation of events. Um, there's a big difference there. When you when you try to do what China did and was uniquely able to do and lock down a region, the natural human instinct is to try to, try to get the hell out of that region. Mm -hmm. And that's going to make things worse. Um, by making this more of a voluntary thing and telling people, look, here's what the risk is. You really ought to cancel stuff that doesn't have to be done that involves interacting with other people. Um, and I think people are are embracing that, certainly from the emails I'm now getting from my daughter's school. They're embracing this. Yep. Um, yeah. And, and that is the kind of approach that will work, I think, because it's it's motivated from the bottom up rather than the top down. Yeah, I agree completely with everything that you guys are saying. And I also think that I've become more um, pro sort of social distancing the more I have understood about the role of asymptomatic um, spread. Yes. Um, and so we cannot have just people who are infected stay home at this point because we realize how important asymptomatic spread is. And, and a lot of the criticism that we've leveled against things like quarantine and travel restrictions was during past epidemics of things like Ebola virus, which is a very, very different situation. Yes. <laughs> you're, you're not going to have a lot of asymptomatic people walking around happy and healthy and spreading the virus. Exactly. Um, so this is, this is a very different situation. I'd like to take this opportunity to say that uh, uh, this has been on my mind for uh, a little while. If you go back to the our first episodes on this, this is now I think our seventh uh, podcast on uh, the coronavirus thing. Uh, it, initially, as I saw this emerging in China, uh, I was pretty blasé about it, and I figured figured it would burn out there. And I remember in particular 
uh, going through a bunch of my own calculations and figuring that it wouldn't spread run, uh, spread much. And uh, I was dead wrong. Okay. <laughs> this is uh, proven to be a uh, much bigger deal than I ever anticipated. And I'm going to school on this. All right. Likewise. Every, every day, every day is a new day. As, uh, as Brianne just said, uh, I really had it drilled into me today for the first time from Ralph about the asymptomatic shedding. And that's a big deal. That's yeah. a big deal. Okay. So, uh, you know, we can, we can, we can grow with this epidemic. Absolutely. Um, so she continues on another note, I've really enjoyed hearing the firsthand accounts from your Chinese listeners. My husband last night told me that he had just had a call with his colleagues in Shanghai, and they shared the measures that they are taking currently, which include working in shifts to limit how many people are in contact with each other, both on transit and in the office, working from home as much as they can, calling into group meetings in the office, even when they are there physically, they are no longer meeting in conference rooms at all, and doing temperature checks on the way to the office each day. He told me that one of their main trade shows his business attends and exhibits at the International Housewares Trade Show, or IHA, which usually draws about 60,000 people to Chicago each March from all over the world, was canceled. Mm. The long-ranging effects of this disease on the environment and the economy will be interesting to watch. Yes. It's very true. <laughs> I've shared a number of articles below, including the potential effects of this situation on Chinese pollution levels, how Chinese restaurants in Seattle are suffering, and an article that explains that the Seattle Flu Study, a new University of Washington group that sends swab kits out to the public, I have three of their boxes sitting next to my desk, in fact, and my daughter hates doing the nose swabs but loves playing virologist, <laughs> played a role in identifying the second Washington COVID-19 case. Mm. And lastly, there's been a lot of talk around here about how this virus might play out differently in places like Italy, where your job is guaranteed even if you stay home sick and healthcare is socialized, yes. versus the U.S., where you can lose your job if you don't show up, and where many people do not have access to healthcare or the means to pay for it. Um, yes, I think that those are also important points to be thinking about. However, it didn't stop the outbreak in Italy. It certainly no. did not. <clears throat> Thanks, as always, for your commitment to truth-seeking and truth-sharing and for always being pedantic and entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad somebody likes being pedantic. <laughs> it's 52 degrees and cloudy here in Seattle with a chance of coronavirus. Be nice to Dixon. And that's from Jody. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what a wonderful letter. Very nice. Lovely. Way to go, Jody. Very nice. Thank you, Jody. Yeah, there's right. there's a bunch of links here. Yeah, a lot of links. Yeah. Thank you so much Thank for yes. a lot good of stuff. These will be all at the show notes, microbe.tv slash twiv. Let's do two more. Dixon, can you take the next one? Kevin writes, hi, Vincent and friends. Uh, personal protective equipment has been a recurrent topic on your show recently for good reason. I was very interested to hear of the article you've been citing by Rodonovich et al. that showed little difference in effectiveness between N95s and the surgical masks in preventing occupational exposure to flu in healthcare settings. I thought the attached article might be of some interest to you as well, considered in the light of the Radonovich study, as it shows how much performance can diverge between idealized controlled conditions and the real world. As you have been emphasizing, N95s are designed to provide protection from airborne droplet nuclei, whereas surgical masks are designed to be fluid barriers only. This study demonstrates the magnitude of the difference in protective, protection factors between the two, along with makeshift coverings, while showing that surgical masks do provide some very limited benefit against airborne exposure if used properly. It also explores the reduction in particulates generated when masks of various kinds are worn by a sick, per sick person, in this experiment, a mechanical head, <clears throat> which is surprisingly low, but <laughs> better than nothing. <laughs> Best regards. <clears throat> um, I read more. Um, Kevin McGee, yes, the same one from your IBC a few years back. Greetings from Auckland, New Zealand, where it is a cloudy 23 degrees C. Uh, note, the FFP2 masks tested in the attached study are the Dutch equivalent of the N95S. In case attachment doesn't work, Vander uh, Saudi right, gets M a citation. 
<clears throat> Sorry, that's a citation. That's right. Yeah, just a citation. Okay, fine. That's funny. Kevin was on the IBC years ago. I'm on the Institutional Biosafety Committee. Oh, and okay. uh, that's great that you're listening, Kevin. Thanks. Yes. Uh, let's do one more. Rich. Okay, David, David writes. David. Fascinating report. You mentioned that many different respiratory illnesses have fallen in Hong Kong in two uh, in 2020 compared to 2019. Right. So that was referring to the graph we did last time uh, that suggests that the general uh, sort of uh, health awareness standards have impacted other diseases. If it has been written up anywhere, I would be interested in a link. We never got that, did we? No, we got a link to the raw numbers from Hong okay. Kong. So you would have to, you know, for every year previous to this one, so you'd have to regraph it. Right. But uh, I will note, however, that it, ha it, ha it may be hard to attribute the broad decline in to any specific interventions. As it turns out, I was in Hong Kong for the month of February. Tourism was already down as a result of the political instabilities that have been ongoing since last summer right. and was absolutely cratered with reports of the viral outbreak in Wuhan in January. Hotel occupancies were well below 50%, and all of the U.S. carriers canceled all flights between the U.S. and Hong Kong in early February. Fortunately, we were booked on Cathay, Cathay Pacific. Memories of stars, SARS are still fresh, and Hong Kong reacted early and aggressively to the Wuhan outbreak. Museums, right. schools, cultural centers, and many government offices, uh, offices were closed, although most businesses remain open. Everyone was wearing surgical masks on the street. Hand sanitizer dispensers were ubiquitous, and workers uh, could be seen regularly disinfecting elevator buttons, door fixtures, and escalator handrails. Hotels and high-rises had people posted at the entrance and were measuring the temperature of everyone entering the building. And yes, everyone was washing their hands frequently. So I'm not surprised that the incidence of respiratory viruses has fallen broadly, but it's hard to say which specific intervention, intervention did how much. That's a wonderful perspective. That's great. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important to emphasize that the infectivity of a virus, R0, is not an intrinsic feature of the virus, but also depends on the environment and social behaviors. I'm going to interject here. I believe that R0, R0, is in fact an intrinsic feature of the virus. We use these terms uh, inappropriately, but there's R or RE, which is the effective That's right. uh, reproduction right. number, is R0 that has in influenced by various social behaviors, okay? At any rate, R0, uh, he says, is a statistical measure of how many people on average on average, a case infects. True. If people practice disciplined hygiene and social distancing, the number of new infections will on average fall. That gives you the effective reproduction rate. That Hong gives you Kong RE, and, yes. Yeah, RE. Hong Kong and Singapore have both seen lower rates of growth in COVID-19 cases compared to other countries outside of mainland China. Non-pharmaceutical interventions, NPI, can make a big difference, and right now they all have. Thanks, David. P.S. On a previous show, you identified me as a professor of human genetics at the University of Michigan. I was, in fact, a professor of human genetics, but that was more than a decade ago, and I have since left to pursue opportunities in biotechnology and drug development. I believe Kathy and I have met in the context of graduate <laughs> education committees, PIBs, small world, go blue. David states, uh, who wrote to us uh, last week, uh, as well. Yeah, I think uh, the reproductive number is uh, really important. And Ralph, uh, I thought in his discussions, referred to it um, several times in, in a really illuminating fashion because he talked about how uh, uh, our health care practices, public health practices, and et cetera, uh, and herd immunity ultimately affect the effective reproduction rate and the idea is to do whatever you can to get that down to less than one right where right where where the you're not amplifying the disease and once you get it down to the re effective reproduction number down to less than one even though the r naught 
may still, the intrinsic value may still be two or whatever. If you get the effective number down to less than one, now you're going to squash the disease. Right. Exactly. Very cool. And that's a really nice explanation too. Yep. Yes. I have to say, uh, we, these are all great questions and comments. We have gotten more TWIV email than at any other time in our existence. It's great. We're on page 16 out of 46, or page 15 <laughs> out of 46 pages of emails. And more continue yeah. to come in, and I have to say, don't yes. stop, because we will get to them eventually. Yep, um, that's right. So uh, if you want to see some of these emails, microbe.tv slash TWIV. If you want to send some in, please do, TWIV at microbe.tv. Someone said before, oh, I didn't know you give out last names. We generally don't unless you're a doctor or a scientist, uh, you know, we and we give out your last name. Otherwise, for most people, we don't uh, because doctors and scientists don't have any privacy, of course. We don't need your Certainly, if you write in and you have a preference as to whether or not we use your name, yeah, you state it. We'll, right. we'll, you could, we'll do what you want. Many people want to remain anonymous. That's fine. But send them in. We will get to you. Uh, but I want to stop here at two hours because uh, you got a lot to listen to, and I think yep. that's about enough right. for you. And I can't tax my hosts anymore. Uh, I don't know. I could go on all afternoon. <laughs> That's true. Well, you know, if if listeners want more virology right now, just go back and listen to that first hour with Ralph because that was yeah. There's a lot of information there. there. Yes, amazing. I would agree. If you like what we do, consider supporting us financially. Many new people have joined our, to support us. We really appreciate that. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute and use PayPal or Patreon to give us as little as a dollar a month or chunks of money, whatever you'd prefer. Dixon de Palmier is at parasiteswithoutborders.com and thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. Pleasure. Did you teach your course online today? I did. How'd it go? Yeah. Well, it was good. I'm, you know, uh, you know, there's always this uh, disconnect that you get when you're talking into a screen. That's right. Um, yeah. I like to see their reaction to the things that I'm saying, and I like to stop, sure. and allow them to ask questions, and it, it's very difficult as to have an interactive experience long distance. Yeah, I taught this week and uh, gave an exam this week. Oh, and, wow. Um, had office hours yesterday, which was, were all questions about SARS-CoV-2, nothing about the course. <laughs> <laughs> Should I go home right. for spring break? <laughs> yeah, that's right. They're off. Brian Barker's over at Drew University in New Jersey on Twitter, Bioprof Barker. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was really great to be here. Um, and I also have been learning how to teach online. Uh, the past few days, and I'm going to start teaching with uh, Zoom on Monday. Yeah, that's what right. we use. We use we, Zoom. And we, that's, that's it for the rest of the semester. Exams, all teaching, it's all online. I think uh, that's a good you, idea. Zoom's easy to use. Sorry, Dixon? I said Zoom is easy to use. Now, here Even on, on TWIV, we use Skype for this because I think the it's easier to get good sound on. That's good. Even a caveman living in Fort Lee, New Jersey can use it. Apparently, <laughs> Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Always a good time. This is great. Alan Dove's He's at safe down. turbidplaque.com over on Twitter. He is Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And by the way, I've been social distancing since before it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> Stay healthy. Yes. Well, um, now we resume our normal TWIV schedule. I'm not traveling for a long time. In fact, I, <laughs> I guess uh, not. Trip canceled <laughs> next week. Yeah, I'm here, There's so we're going to be else. recording every Friday. And so Great. we'll, we'll all be, to be here. Back. It's good to have you because some of us, I, I have been traveling a lot the last few months and canceling Fridays and so forth. But I am Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I want to thank ASM and ASV for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>